It's good to see everyone here this evening. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 3, we will resume our study in Revelation and look at the letters to Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea this evening. Remember that the Lord is uh, writing to them generally to tell them about the things that they need to tend to uh, before the coming time of difficulty and judgment comes as the Lord is going to come and judge the uh, the wicked Roman Empire, and they need to make sure that they are not participating in its evil or sharing in the evil of the world in general, for that is part of what is going to be judged here. This world that has uh, come under the reign of Rome is going to be judged. And so the Lord is writing to them, pointing out and observing the things that are not right in his sight. And uh, of course, these letters are always instructive for us as well. So Look in chapter 3 and verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." You can't help but read that letter and come away with a sense that Sardis has not been paying attention. The Lord says that you have a name that you're alive, but the fact is you're not. You're something else. You're dead. And you need to, verse 2, wake up. Verse 3, remember, keep it. And if you don't wake up, I'll come as a thief because you're not paying attention and I will come upon you and you won't uh, be prepared. There is this theme running throughout the letter of not taking things very seriously. And as we have seen with some of these other letters, uh, this is probably something that the people of Sardis uh, especially would have related to. Uh, the city of Sardis had an unusually tall and steep Acropolis. If you're not familiar with the word Acropolis, uh, in the ancient world, ancient cities were built on two places. There was the lower city, which is where all the markets and, and the houses and all those things were, and some of the temples. But there was always, always an upper city built on top of a nearby hill, And that upper city would have been surrounded by a wall. The most important temples would have been up on the upper city or the Acropolis. And the Acropolis at Sardis, the stronghold part of the city, was an unusually steep uh, hill, and the city was therefore considered to be unassailable. And, uh, you know, like we said, most ancient cities had these. Probably the most famous Acropolis in the ancient world is Athens, where the Parthenon stands up above the city. But all ancient cities were basically like that. The interesting thing, though, and I'll show you a photograph of this uh, Acropolis in just a moment, is that even though it had a naturally steep and tall upper city with a wall built around its edge, The fact is that the city fell to enemies not once, but twice. And it happened simply through the overconfidence and the carelessness of the people that lived there. The people that lived there simply thought, there is no way an enemy could get up here. And so they did not guard the entire length of the wall. They thought, well, there's a spot over here that our enemies could possibly get up. We'll station some guards there. And they left vast parts of the wall unguarded. And it was exactly those places where the enemy came in. And we hear a bit of a ring of that here in Sardis as well, that you think you're okay, but you're not. And you're asleep, and you need to wake up. You're not very vigilant. You're not very attentive. And you need to remember and wake up, the Lord says to them. There is a view of the Acropolis of Sardis. It is this hill 
in the background. The lower city is down here, and that is where the upper city was. And some of these things that you can see sticking up over here, that's actually a fragment of one of the walls that went around the edge. So if you can imagine in ancient times uh, the edge of this hill here with a wall standing above it, and you can see that the hill itself is naturally just about vertical, that the people must have thought that their city was just completely safe. Uh, here is a view of uh, one of those fragments of the wall. You know, you, an enemy's not going to get up to that. There is no way that they can climb that hill and then climb that wall. And there's another view of one of the corners of the wall. It's just a, a tremendously well-positioned place. And yet, as we said, it was conquered. This is from the Greek historian uh, Herodotus, who described the fall of the city uh, when the Persians broke in. He says this, The taking of Sardis came about as follows. Cyrus, the Persian king that we know about from the Bible, uh, made proclamation to his army, sending horsemen round to the several parts of it, that he would give gifts to the man who should first scale the wall. After this, the army made an attempt, and when it failed, uh, and it, uh, then after all the rest had ceased from the attack, a certain Mardian, whose name was Heroides, made an attempt to approach on that side of the citadel where no guard had been set. For they had no fear that it would ever be taken from that side, seeing that here the citadel is precipitous and unassailable. So then this is, uh, so then this Mardian Heroides having seen on the day before how one of the Lydians had descended on that side of the citadel to recover his helmet, which had rolled down from above, and had picked it up, took thought and cast the matter about in his own mind. So there's a soldier up on the wall up there, drops his helmet. Well, he goes down the little path. He knows exactly the way to go. This Persian soldier is watching him go down and go back up. The Persian says, I know how to get into the city now. And it's a part of the wall that they didn't have any guards on. And so he ascended first, and after that came up others of the Persians. And many thus having made approach, Sardis was finally <laughs> taken. The whole city was given up to plunder. Now, that must have been just absolutely amazing in the ancient world that somebody had actually taken the city of Sardis. Uh, and so the Lord is kind of reminding them of something uh, or using an image that they would have been very familiar with. Uh, there's also another interesting thing about Sardis. There is a river that runs uh, nearby the city called the Patroclus River. And in ancient times, it was full of gold. Uh, this was the ancient kingdom of the Lydians, and the Lydians were famous for being rich in gold. Lydian gold coins were considered the best gold coins uh, in the ancient world. Uh, this is the home of the legend of King Midas. You've probably heard that story, the story about the guy who everything he touched turned to gold. Well, the story goes that in order to be relieved of this thing that was actually a curse for him, that he took a bath in the Patroclus River, and so the gold winds up in the river, and Midas is free from this curse. So uh, that's this area of the world where that story came from. And so not only was it a strong city, uh, but it was also a very wealthy city. And there is what's left of the Patroclus River today. It's just about ankle deep uh, most of the year, I think, at, at, at uh, present. But that's where the river ran. The problem of Sardis, therefore, was a very simple one. They were apathetic and they were overconfident. They said, we're okay. The church turned out to be kind of like the city in which they lived, overconfident of their own situation. And yet twice the Lord tells them, wake up, that they had become inactive. And verse 4, you've got a few people that have not soiled their garments. The implication is that most of you have, because you think everything's okay. And you're engaging in things you shouldn't be doing, but your attitude is flippant and apathetic, and your attitude is, well, it's no big deal. We're Christians. We're the church around here, and, and as long as we keep on doing what we do, everything's going to be okay. And the Lord says, I want you to wake up. Smell the coffee, as we would say. Things are not okay. You've been giving in. You've been soiling your garments. Spiritually, you're dead asleep and not paying attention to what you're doing. And it's time for you to, to get back to what you've done. So 
Remember what you've received and heard. Repent and keep it. Now this is, of course, like all the other letters. Uh, We look at this and we wish, well, what is it exactly that they had slipped up in? Uh, The Lord doesn't say exactly what it was. And remember, he had said to the Ephesians back in chapter 2, that you have left your first love, therefore remember from where you have fallen. He says a similar thing here. Remember what you have received and heard. It's tempting to think that they have compromised maybe the lordship of Jesus, that maybe some of them are dabbling in idolatry and compromising that way. That wouldn't be a far-fetched idea. Whatever it was, we don't know for sure, but... I imagine that uh, this would have been quite a surprise to the church at Sardis to receive this letter and to hear the Lord say this. Because sound asleep, they would have thought, I had no idea things were so bad. Who would have thought that the Lord would have said such a thing to us? That's the, the nature of being spiritually asleep and, of course, the danger of it. Uh, it doesn't take too much imagination, I think, to think of how this might apply to us that we might look at ourselves and say, oh, everything's fine. You know, things are going along well, and we have all kinds of little ways to measure ourselves, uh, our attendance and our offering and, and all of those things. But you notice, that, like in all these other letters, the Lord doesn't say a thing about their size, about their numerical growth or anything like that. It's their spiritual health that the Lord is concerned about. Whether or not they're keeping the faith in their hearts and in their minds And the Lord says, when it comes to that, you're just not there anymore. So it's certainly the kind of thing that we ought to look at, and it ought to provoke introspection uh, for us. All right, then, let's look at the letter to uh, Philadelphia, chapter 3, starting in verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come down and uh, come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Uh, Philadelphia is the only letter of the seven that the Lord doesn't have anything critical to say of them. He says, now you're going to have to make sure that you hold on to what you've got, but he has nothing negative to say about them. So spiritually speaking, it would seem that the church in Philadelphia may have been the healthiest one. Sadly, it is probably the church of which we know the absolute least. Uh, They are mentioned here in Revelation, and unless I am forgetting a passage, they are not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. So just for that reason, it kind of makes us curious about these people. But uh, let's think a little bit about uh, the context in which the Lord says some of these things. Uh, Philadelphia was devastated by an earthquake twice in the first century, in 17 A.D. and again in 23 A.D., Uh, This is a volcanic region, this western part of Turkey, and uh, these were pretty serious earthquakes. We're going to notice in a moment that Laodicea was hit by one as well. And, of course, when you're living in an earthquake zone and you have two earthquakes within six or seven years of each other, it's got to make you nervous to live in a place like that. You'll notice what the Lord says in 3.12, that I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. After an earthquake, you can't stay in your house. If it's damaged, it might collapse, it might fall on you. You couldn't live in your house anymore. 
You had to leave, fix it, and then maybe go back in. But the Lord says to them that I'm going to give you a place that you'll never have to leave. It won't be damaged or ruined by anything. I'll take care of that, and you won't have to go out. Uh, also, this area of uh, Turkey is known for its grape growing. There are just thousands and acres even today in this part of the world of vineyards. It is because of that volcanic region. Uh, grapes like to grow in volcanic soil. That's where they thrive. And so some of the best grapes in the ancient world were grown here. And because of the nature of the soil and because grapes grew so well, wheat was not planted as much as it normally would have been. And sometimes wheat was in short supply in this area. Um, it would have been very difficult to live in this area in times of famine because wheat has to be uh, brought in by wagons. It's expensive to pay people to do that, and it simply would have been a very difficult thing. Uh, we've talked a bit before about some of the conditions at the end of the first century in the reign of Domitian. In about the year 92, Domitian was, as we've noted before, short on cash. The Roman Empire was going broke, and Domitian is trying everything that he can to cut corners and expenses and uh, the price of wheat had gone through the roof, and so Domitian ordered that half the vineyards in Asia be cut down. And this is recorded in uh, Suetonius's biography of the Roman emperor Domitian in uh, paragraphs 7 and 14 there. There is no indication that this was ever enforced. As a matter of fact, as soon as the edict was issued, the people of Asia Minor almost rioted because they made their living and a good living growing grapes. And if you know anything about viticulture, you know that you can't just cut down a grapevine, plant wheat, and then go back to growing grapes the next year. It takes about seven years for a grapevine to begin producing fruit. And so when you cut down a vineyard, you're doing something that is long term. It's not going to be anytime soon until you can get back into that business. Uh, it was such a problem, actually, that Domitian actually rescinded eventually that order. But you'll notice how Jesus positions himself in verse 7. He who is holy and he who is true. Jesus is a true leader of his people. He will not turn against them the way that Domitian had turned against his people. Uh, there is really, well, there's some vineyards uh, from this part of the world, and there are just, you know, hundreds of acres of uh, land like that over there. This is where the ancient city of Philadelphia stood. There is a modern Turkish city built on the very site, uh, the very same site, so it's not like you can go there and, and see a lot of uh, old temples and things like that. Uh, there is one spot where there are the ruins of a theater. Believe it or not, that's the sort of the stage end of a theater, but other than that, there are no antiquities around there. So not only do we not know much about the history of this church, there's not much physical remains of anything standing around there to look at either. Uh, the Lord says to them in uh, verse 8 that you have not denied my name. And we've talked before about Pliny and his letter number 96 written to the Emperor Trajan, but I just wanted to remind you of the situation that happened in the early 2nd century. This is Pliny writing to the Emperor about what to do with Christians. Remember he said that uh, I gave a test to people who were accused of being Christians and notice the part in yellow, others who were named by the informer at first confessed themselves Christians and then denied it. True, they had been of that persuasion, but they had quit it. Some three years, some many years, a few as much as 25 years ago. They all worshipped your statue and the images of the gods and cursed Christ. These are lapsed Christians people who said before the governor that I'm not a Christian anymore. I deny Jesus Christ. And they would worship the images of the gods to prove that they had no more loyalty to Jesus. 
we hear a hint of the testing as the Lord says that you have not denied my name. Now, we don't know what was going on in Philadelphia. Were there public trials? Were people being accused of things? We just don't know. But apparently something like this was going on uh, as well. He says there in verse 9 that I will cause the synagogue of Satan to come and bow down at your feet. They say that they are Jews and they are not, but they lie. We've seen this before in one of the previous letters, the letters to Pergamum, that there was a synagogue of Satan there. Was it Pergamum? Uh, no, that was Satan's throne. The synagogue of Satan was at Smyrna. Smyrna. Um, and remember, we've seen this text before, but again, it is germane that as Domitian is trying to collect all the tax money that he can, that he is trying to enforce the Jewish tax. Remember, in the first century, there was a Jewish tax. If you were a Jew, you had to pay a special tax. And there is this strange statement in the history that besides other taxes, that on the Jews was levied with the utmost rigor, and those who were and those were prosecuted who, without publicly acknowledging that faith, yet lived as Jews. Most historians believe that that is a reference to Christians. And the possible scenario is that the Jews, of course, we know this is a fact, that the Jews were exempt from worshiping the gods of Rome. And so problems develop. The Christians are now being asked to show their loyalty to the emperor, and it is it seems likely, based on the statement there in Suetonius, that persecu persecuted Christians may have associated themselves with synagogues. That, well, I'll just go and, and attend synagogue services on Saturday. Some of these may have even been converted Jews in the first place, and they may have thought that, well, then the Romans will leave me alone. But apparently what happened is that the Jews informed on them and excluded them from the synagogue and basically said, hey, these people, they're not one of us, and if you Romans are after people, they're the ones. Now, that's a lot of guesswork, and I certainly wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that we know that that's what's going on. But it is a possible scenario based on uh, what we hear in the ancient history records and what we hear here as well. Uh, some kind of problem with Jews uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the Lord says that you have kept the word of my perseverance, unlike uh, Sardis. They have not forgotten, but they have kept the word. And so the Lord says in verse 11, To him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. That suggests that they will have an intimate place with God. We've seen in other places in the New Testament, Ephesians 2, 1 Corinthians 6, and so forth, that the church is the temple of God. And we're going to see at the end of the book of Revelation that the temple of God is basically heaven, that where God's people are, that is God's temple. And the Lord says here that I'll make you a pillar in that temple, something that suggests stability, permanence, that you'll be one of God's people and there will not be any kind of destruction. Uh, just to give you the size of the scale of some of these ancient temples, you can see the people in the photograph here. This is some of the columns of the Temple of Artemis at the city of Sardis. And they are tremendously large columns. The ancients, of course, saw these kinds of things in the architecture around them often and when the Lord says, I'll make you a pillar, it certainly would have been a very kind of a, a startling uh, or stark image for them. I will make him a pillar, the Lord says, and he will not go out anymore, as we suggested, in contrast to the earthquake danger that these people lived in, that they would now be in safety, no need to go outside, no more harm, no more threat but everything would be a safe life for them. And uh, the Lord says, And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and my new name. 
And that meant in ancient times basically what it means today. You write your name on something, it means it's yours. And when the Lord says, I'm going to write my name on that person, it means that I'm going to mark that person as belonging to me. That doesn't mean that they had a mark in their flesh or a tattoo or anything like that. This is figurative language. But it is the Lord saying that I'm going to claim that person as mine, that I own them, that they're with me. And it would also have been a mark of dedication. Uh, in ancient temples, sometimes you'll see writing on the columns, and it will say, so-and-so paid to have this column erected, or it is dedicated to so-and-so. And so it would have suggested also the idea that they are dedicated to the Lord and recognized as such. And interestingly, in the first century, the name of the city of Philadelphia had been renamed twice. And Philadelphia was its latest name. And so when the Lord says, I'm going to write my name on you, change your name, as it were, the name of my city, my name, uh, the ancients in Philadelphia would have understood that. Uh, one of the names of the ancient city, uh, I think, was something like Caesaropolis or something like that. It had the name of the king uh, written into it. No, it was Neo Caesarea was one name. And then during the time uh, of the Flavian emperors, uh, it was called Flavia. The city was called Flavia. By Domitian's time, it was called Philadelphia. So writing the name, giving a new name, changing the name, giving you a new identity, the name of the king, all of these people would have understood that very well. Uh, any thoughts or observations, questions down through the letter to Philadelphia here? Yes. Does what the historical record tells you about the change of your names of the city help you date when this letter must have been written? I did not jot down the dates. Uh, it was named Neo Caesarea after the 17 AD earthquake because Rome helped pay to rebuild the city. And it had the name of Flavia from the years 64 to 79 AD. So I think the answer to your question is that it would help us to date the book after 79 AD. All right, let's move on to Laodicea. Then Laodicea is probably one of the more well-known of these letters, simply because of the intriguing imagery in it. Uh, we probably hear more about this one because of this graphic image of the Lord saying, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Uh, it's not often that the Lord gets that graphic with people. But uh, he says there in verse 14, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot or cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Um, you'll very often hear it suggested that the water supply of Laodicea was lukewarm water. I can't find any reference in the ancient literature that says that. Uh, that's a guess based on people reading the book of Revelation, but there are comments in the ancient authors about the water supply of Laodicea, and some of the authors that mention it say that, that it was mineral water. There was like, it was like a kind of a chalky appearance sometimes. It had so much minerals in it. But nobody seems to complain about the temperature of the water. Uh, it does not seem that the water supply of the, the city is what the Lord is talking about. I think rather the imagery is based on ancient usage of water and dining. You'll notice in verse 20 that the Lord says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him. And so the imagery is not about the water that came into the city. It's about the ability of the Lord to have fellowship with these people <laughs> in the image of a meal. And the ancients, of course, had preferences about what they liked to drink and what they didn't drink. And they were basically just like ours. Uh, this is an ancient author named Xenophon. He wrote an account 
that is supposedly a memoir of Socrates. Now, whether it actually is or not, you know, who knows? Probably not. But in this conversation that we get to hear with Socrates, there's a discussion about water. Uh, another person complained that the drinking water at home was hot. Consequently, Socrates said, well, the good thing is, at least when you want, want hot water to wash in, you have it at hand. And the guy says in response to that, no, it's not that hot. It's too cold for water. It's not hot enough to wash things in, but it's too hot to drink. And then Socrates asks, well, do your servants complain when they use it for both drinking and washing since it's not hot enough to wash and it's too hot to drink? And the guy says, well, I've often been surprised that they're content to do that. And it becomes clear from this that the ancients believe that there is a use for hot water. You use hot water for washing things. But when you're thirsty, you want a cold drink. And the problem with lukewarm water is that you can't use it for washing. You can't use it to quench your thirst. It really doesn't have a use. Uh, this is uh, Plato in his Republic you got to love Greek philosophers. They debated the definition of thirst. What is thirst? That's a great philosophical topic, isn't it? Is thirst a thirst for hot drink or cold? Or much or little? Or in a word, for a drink of any particular quality? You know, what is it that you're wanting when you're thirsty? Or is it the fact that if thirst is accompanied by heat, the desire is for a cold drink? Or if the thirst is accompanied by cold, then the desire is for a hot drink. Now, the ancients are saying exactly what we say. On a hot day, I want a cold drink. On a cold day, I want a hot cup of coffee. That what I want depends on the circumstances, but there are times when I want a hot drink. There's times when I want a cold drink. Hot water is useful. Cold water is useful. But on a hot day, I don't want lukewarm water, and I don't want it on a cold day either. And so the point of this image is not about being zealous or inactive, hot and cold, like on fire versus no activity. The point the Lord is making is that you're useless to me. If you were hot, I could do something with you because there is a use for hot water. And if you were cold, that would be okay too because there is a use for cold water. But you're lukewarm. And I can't do anything with that. And so... The, the Lord's warning is that I don't have a use for you. And what a shocking thing to say to a church. Here they are, the church of Christ in Laodicea. And here we are, we're, you know, we're the church here and we're the Christians and the Lord writes to them and says, I, I don't have really any use for you folks. What a thing to say. What, what, a, what, a, what a judgment to hear from the Lord. The church had ceased to be useful for him. But it goes on. The Lord says, You say that I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you actually are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Three things that the Lord says, three additional things. First of all, you're wretched, miserable, and poor. Now, the irony of it is that Laodicea was a banking town. Now, there were other banking towns in Asia Minor. Probably the biggest banks were in Ephesus. But there were some well-known trade centers, banking centers, uh, banking institutions in Laodicea. There was money in this town. And the Lord says, you know, the irony is, is that you are in a rich place, but you're not rich. You're toward, toward the Lord. You're very poor. Luke 12, 21, the Lord spoke a parable about those who trusted in themselves and were not rich toward God. James in James chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Has not the Lord chosen the poor in this world to be rich toward God and heirs of eternal life? It's possible to be rich toward God or poor toward God. And the Lord says to them, therefore, in verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. You're not rich in my estimation, spiritually speaking, and you need to get some from me. 
uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 20, we hear in the Sermon on the Mount, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not consume and thieves do not break through and steal. That's the gold that the Lord wants them to lay up. In Matthew 19, 21, uh, we have the story of the rich young ruler who went away sorrowful because he had many possessions and yet, obviously, spiritually, he was bankrupt. And so the Lord says, spiritually, you're poor. Not only that, he says to them in verse 17 that you are blind. Uh, blindness is a very common criticism of the prophet's Isaiah 42, 19, and 20, we hear Isaiah saying of the people of his day that they had become blind. Jesus said the Pharisees were blind in about five verses in a row. In Matthew chapter 23, said you are blind and fools. And in ancient literature outside of the Bible, the word blind was used figuratively of wealthy people who could not see their true condition in life. We've got some people like that in our society today that they think because they're rich that everything's okay when actually they are miserable. And so the Lord says, not only are you bankrupt, but you just can't see your own condition. You've got yourself fooled, and therefore you need to buy ISAV from me to clarify their vision, to see their own shameful condition. And the irony of this is that there was a hot springs in the nearby city of Hierapolis. You can see the city of Hierapolis from Laodicea. It's that close. And there is a, a marvelous formation at Hierapolis called the Cotton Cascade. There's a hot spring that runs down the mountain. The water evaporates and the minerals are there on the rock. And the whole side of the mountain is a big sheet of white minerals. You can see it for miles. And even to this day, people in Turkey go and wash their eyes in that mineral water because they believe it will help their eyesight. And the ancients believed that as well. And here they are in the midst of a place where just, just down the road they can go and, and fix their eyesight, but the Lord says, spiritually, you're blind. And then the third thing he says to them is that not only are you poor and blind, but verse 17, you're naked. And of course... In the biblical way of thinking, that's always a shameful thing. It's a shame to be naked. And the irony of this is that Laodicea was famous for making clothing in the ancient world. And the Lord says that you need to buy garments from me that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Uh, the ancient Greek author Strabo uh, wrote a book on geography. It's a very important source of information about the way things were back in ancient times. And he says this, that the ground around Laodicea produces sheep. It doesn't mean they plant them. It means they graze. Okay. Uh, that are excellent. Just want to make sure we all get that. Uh, not only for the softness of their wool, in which they surpass even Milesian wool, but also for its raven black color so that the Laodiceans derive splendid revenue from it. This is a place where you could buy clothing at every corner. There's all kinds of weavers and, and sheep shearers and, and all kinds of uh, seamstresses and so forth. And the Lord says you need to buy garments and not those black ones that they sell there in Laodicea. You need to buy white garments from me. In the ancient world, white garments always indicated honor. And uh, you could usually tell in the ancient world the social position of somebody by the clothing that they wore. Governors, senators, emperors wore white. Common people didn't. And so when the Lord says you, will, you should buy white garments from me, the Lord indicates that you need to obtain the honor that you've been lacking spiritually and uh, regain that in my sight. Now, the Lord says in verse 19, uh, now, I say this for your benefit. I love you, and therefore I reprove you and discipline you. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You can either get angry about this and, and, and just quit, or you can listen to my advice and fix what is right. There's some uh, black goats 
from this region. There's one of the black sheep, the guy up there shearing one of them. The Lord says, buy from me white garments. Uh, any thoughts or observations here on the church at Laodicea? Anything that is said to them? Notice the Lord appeals to them in verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. You know, After a letter like that, it might be that, well, we don't want to hear from the Lord anymore. But the Lord says, I want to hear from you, and I'm going to stand at the door and knock. I'm, I'm interested in your spiritual condition, and if you will open the door to me, I will come in, dine with you, we'll have fellowship, everything will be fine, but I want you to overcome and to sit down with me on my throne and reign with me uh, over your enemies. And so he gives them perhaps a particular challenge, and remember that that's kind of how the list started off, that Ephesus had lost their first love and, and had drained the spiritual life out of themselves in the process. Laodicea is much the same way. Well, thank you very much for your attention. As always, we will look at uh, chapter 4 next week.